You're welcome to the Personality Profile segment on BTA Politics, where we bring to you an exclusive interview with renowned personalities who have made or attained status in terms of them building integrity from the, for themselves in the country. For today, we are privileged to have uh, as a personality for the week, our very own most reverend, Professor Emmanuel Asante. He's the chairman of the National Peace Council, Ghana. Hello, Professor. <laughs> Hello, my brother. How are you doing, sir? By the grace of God, I'm doing fine. That's yes. lovely. That's yes. lovely. Yeah. Uh, today, you are, we are really happy to have you as our uh, personality for this week. And before we go, most Ghanaians are very inquisitive. They want to know more about you. So <laughs> we'll first of all start with your history. When is, who is Professor Santi? Well, let me first of all express sincere thanks to you. Um, it's a privilege um, to have me as your personality of the week. I, I don't think I deserve that. Um, I have a very humble beginning. Um, I am the third born of my mother. And my father, I think I'm number 16 or 17. Wow. Um, my father comes from uh, a town very close to Kumasi called Intonsu, mm -hmm. known for its um, Edinkra um, designs and cloth clothes. And my mother comes from the Mapon area, Ejra, mm -hmm. um, in the uh, Ejra. That's where my mother comes from. I was educated in different places and completed my middle school living certificate in 1965 mm -hmm. at the Ejra. Anglican Middle School. Um, then attempts attempts were made to try to give me secondary education, but I tell you, my second year, it was very difficult because of financial difficulties. So, I, as I sit here, I speak as a secondary school dropout. Okay, mm -hmm. um, in, in my second year, but for me, I was not daunted by that kind of experience because I felt that. Um, that shouldn't be the end of the story. So I struggled hard, studied privately and all that. But I became a Christian at a very early age. I mean, I'm mean a committed Christian. And I felt that the Lord was calling me to uh, preach his word. It was just about that time that the present day Christian Service University College mm -hmm. started as Christian Service College. And I had the privilege to be one of the pioneer students because I was interested in getting educated, you know. And so I was one of the pioneers. I went to Christian Service College, studied hard, passed my examinations. And just when I was completing Christian Service College, I got a scholarship to study in London, uh, in, a, in, a, in a college called London Bible College, now called London School of Theology. Wow. I did studies there just when I had completed with my diploma in religious studies in Cambridge University certificate course. I had the opportunity to study in Canada, a scholarship again. Interesting. You know, to study in uh, St. Paul University, which is um, um, also federated to the University uh, of Ottawa. So I studied in both universities. Uh, what, what course did you do in Canada then? And what certificate did you come out with? did theology. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Canada, I took my first degree, second degree, and third degree PhD. <laughs> in fact, I took two <laughs> bachelor's degrees. That is serious. A master's degree and a PhD. Mm -hmm. I came back to Ghana in 1986 um, after having been away for almost um, 10 years and I came back as a minister in the Methodist Church because already when I was here I was a staunch Methodist mm -hmm. and so I came back got ordained in the Methodist ministry and I worked in the Methodist ministry in Kumasi area then I was brought to Trinity Theological Seminary in Legon as um, assistant principal Later on, I became the president of the seminary. Um, uh, for whilst years. you were the president at the, at the seminary, mm. um, where what are some of the transform transformations that you brought about? A number of a number of transformations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I came, 
at that time, Trinity Theological Seminary was in affiliation with Legon. They uh, couldn't do their own degrees. I introduced a number of courses because I came in as an academic dean and also as vice principal. And uh, it was during my time that Trinity gained a charter to be a full-fledged university. And now Trinity is offering courses in up to PhD. Mm. So um, these were some of the things that God used some of us and you know, with our colleagues to, to do. There's one quote that when I was doing the research, it came up and, um, and it was in a in very interesting one. I don't know what you have to say about this, but it says that in God, in God, the nobody becomes a somebody. It seems that it's some of your favorite quote that usually. Goes yeah, that, that sums up my story because um, considering that in secondary school, my second year, I dropped out of school and people have had that kind of experience and that has been the end of it. And I was a nobody, okay? But by the grace of God, this nobody became a somebody. I mean, the, the fact that, you know, had the opportunity to study abroad and even to do a, doc, a doctorate, PhD, and to come home and also minister, teach in a prestigious seminary. Remember that, you know, Trinity Theological Seminary happens to be one of the most prestigious seminaries in, in our sub-region, a well-known institution. And I didn't go there just as a lecturer. I went there as a vice principal, and later became the president of the seminary, mm -hmm. taught a number of courses, and rose to become an associate professor. You know, um, and then I also had the opportunity to even lecture at KNUSD as the first substantive head of the, the Department of Religious Studies at quite an KNUSD. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can only explain this in terms of you know, God making the nobody a somebody. One thing that is very interest me is when I was going through your profile, I realized that you had a interest to also advocate for peace continuously every every coming election and also in, into the Ghana's political terrain, where continuously we've seen tension amongst political divide. Mm. When was the time or breakthrough for you to decide to embark on this particular advocacy? Well, I think it is important for you to know that I am a theologian. I, my specialty is systematic theology. And I, as part of my studies, I did social ethics. I got introduced to liberation theology, uh, political theology. Mm -hmm. Studied in not just um, um, theology, but also studied philosophy, political philosophy and all that. Did you know a little bit of you know um, studies in government and, and politics? You know, so I was very much concerned about relevance mm -hmm. of the faith. And for me, what is the point in preaching to people to commit their lives to the Lord if the message has nothing to do with their social concerns? So, right from the word go, in my preaching and in my writings. I was very much concerned about the application of the faith to social issues. And remember, we came at a time that this country was under the military rule. Mm -hmm. It was at the time when the, uh, JJ was in power and had not even decided to cede, you know, um, power to constitutional government. And so, as some of us got ourselves involved. I was writing uh, in, in the Pioneer, trying to call for the need for the will of the people to be respected. You know, so um, my activism in social ethics and national politics, not partisan politics, um, started um, from my own um, studies in, 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 in theology. I believe those times, I, were, I wasn't even born then, but um, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, according to Richard, it came out that during those times there was tension where um, most um, persons who decide to go against the government of the day or let's say stand for a certain um, 
a belief that they believe in and, and think they can push it to ensure there's peace had certain uh, contention with the government of the day where we witnessed that people's family were kidnapped. How did your family accept this particular statement? It was not an easy thing. Uh, you know, I mean, that was the time when we called the culture of silence. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, a lot of people wouldn't want to um, get themselves to talk mm -hmm. because at that time it was too dangerous to talk on, on, on issues. So, um, for those of us who committed uh, our lives and committed ourselves to um, talking mm -hmm. on these issues, it was not an easy thing. I remember one day my father-in-law coming over to my wife and saying that I didn't sleep tonight because I had said something and it had been given a headline. You know, um, what I had said had been published. And it was scary for him because he knew that if I was not careful, it was going to be something. But nothing happened to me. Um, I mean, I expressed myself and, uh, and uh, um, I wasn't doing this with malice because I was doing it in the interest of the nation. And uh, I don't think that... So it, have you ever had any confrontation from any individual or any political party? I have not had any confrontation with any individual. Um, I was writing and, and, and to the, through the Pioneer and I also uh, quite a number of other papers, you know, um, expressing my ideas. I was not attacking individuals. I was speaking on issues, the need for you know, human rights, observation, and so on and so forth. You've written a couple, some couple of books and some, I realize you wrote the, uh, one book on the New Old Testament. You also wrote one on the Ghanaian politics. Um, uh, you also made a reflection on the Ghanaian experience. On that particular one on politics, uh, what was the theme and what were you emphasizing as the message? No, I think, you know, um, one of the courses that I taught at Trinity, and I continue to teach that course. Mm -hmm. It's a course in social ethics. We call it church and society. And church and society dealt with issues of church and culture, church and politics. Should a Christian be involved in, 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 in national politics and so on? And the book came out of that, you know, from my reflections. And my contention is that um, you cannot call yourself a Christian and simply define Christianity in terms of this world is not my home. I, I, I'm on record to have said that, listen, even if this world is not your home, it is your path to your home. So clear the path, lest you are bitten by a snake. It means that, you know, even if this world is not your home, your commitment to the Lord also challenges you to be involved in what obtains here. And that's what my book was all about. I was trying to say that we cannot fold our arms and think that as Christians we have no role to play in national politics. This kind of patriotism which you exhibited and championed in um, the cause of um, belonging to a particular nation whose integrity you uphold high, do you foresee that this 21st century youth and um, the political discourse have these distinguished personalities who have the spirit to fight for this nation? I have no doubt about that. You know, the fact that a lot of young people are keen and they are interested mm -hmm. in the political landscape in terms of getting themselves involved is that these are all, you know, um, also interested in in national politics, mm -hmm. except that, you know, I mean, they need mentors, people to channel the, their desires so that politics doesn't become, I try to do something to gain, you know, positions myself, but that I try to do, you know, something that will enable me um, as, as a Ghanaian um, to contribute towards the welfare and the growth and the development of Ghana. You know, a lot of people today have defined politics in terms of what is in it for me. 
what am I going to get? But I think it's a sacrificial thing. And we should understand that in politics, we are seeking the welfare of our country. We are mm -hmm. seeking the development of our country. And that we are not just looking for something for ourselves. And, and, and that is what we need people, um, mentors, you know, to let us know so that we can channel our desire to be involved in national politics um, altruistically to, 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 to ensure the well-being of Ghana and not just individual well-being. Okay. Because your individual well-being mm -hmm. will come out of the well-being of the country. Okay. Then we'll go for a short commercial break and when we come back, we're still live on the personality profile live segment on BTA politics and when we come back he's going to go into the issue of his position as the chairman of the national peace council stay tuned we'll right back gn bank has come on board hooray did you take a loan from the student loan trust fund for your tertiary education having challenges on how to pay back the student loan relax you can now pay your student loan at gn bank GN Bank, the bank that provides unparalleled excellence in service anytime, any place, and anywhere. The good news is that you don't have to be a customer of GN Bank before you can repay your loan. All you need is to walk into any branch of GN Bank nationwide and make your payment. GN Bank can also set up a standing order or undertake transfers directly from a person's account to that of Student Loan Trust Fund. But this is for interested persons who will open an account with us. Remember to pay your student loan in any of our 108 locations nationwide. For more information, call us on 0302-218855 or 0202-220360 or email us at info at gnbank.com. You can also visit our website, www.gnbankghana.com. GN Bank, the people's bank. Do you know that there are more successful people in Ghana today than before? Well, that is the truth. And the secret is in prudent financial planning with the right financial manager. You need to know the right fund manager who spends your money 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 4 weeks in a month, and 12 months in a year. That manager is at Gold Coast Fund Management. At Gold Coast, your money never sleeps. It revolves every second to give you more money for use when you really need it. For the past 21 years, Gold Coast Fund Management has held a strong reputation of spending people's money to beat inflation, depreciation, and treasure bill rates. Put your money to work. Move from savings to investment. Pay your investment tight into the gold fund and gold money market fund and be assured that when you are in need, you can tend to them to resolve your financial problem. Gold Coast Fund Management investment advice worth its weight in gold. It's amazing how in this age and time, people still consider their children to be their pension. You cannot guarantee what your child becomes in future or whether they will live that long. This is why you have to work on getting your own pension and no one does it better than Pen Trust Limited. Pen Trust is the only pensions trustee with a wide regional and district presence in Ghana. You can do business with us wherever you are in Ghana. We combine discipline and technology to make sure that your second and third tier pension funds are managed objectively and in accordance with your decision decisions and investment objectives. We act with discipline always. Come to us, relax, and your future will be taken care of. Locate Pen Trust on the sixth floor of Premier Towers, opposite Pension House, near the National Theatre. You may call us on 030-290-1500 or 030-290-0989. Pen Trust, we act with discipline always. Pen Trust is a member of Group Indom. of fresh meat, fruit and vegetables. This is for chicken and fish. This is for beef and for fresh fruits. For your pastries, salad, use this. 
Every food item you want to carry in style, Fresh Pack is your choice. For more information, call 050 642 1370. Fresh Pack, eat fresh, stay healthy. Okay, you're welcome back to from just a short commercial break. We are live on BTA, and the program is BTA Politics, a segment which has to do with the personality for the week. And today we are privileged to have as a personality, uh, Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante. He is the chairman of the National Peace Council. Now we we'll go straight to the case where uh, his position as the chairman of the National Peace Council. Um, so, Prof, please, um, over the years, the issue of peace has been something that every year, every time we're going to enter into election, is being proclaimed as the main source of ensuring that the security of our country is secured. But going into 2016 election, or before looking at our political history, is, has it always been the case where we've had serious challenges upholding peace? Thank you very much. Let me first of all say this, that the National Peace Council mm -hmm. and the University of Cape Coast did a study in this country. We were trying to look at hotspots um, of violence and so on. And I must say that, you know, politics wasn't the first. It was resource issues, okay, land issues, chieftaincy disputes. These came tops. In terms of politics, it's something that we, a ritual that we go through every four years. Mm -hmm. Okay? Every four years we go through this ritual. Now, why is it that, you know, during the year when we're going to have elections, we tend to be so much hyped up? Throughout Africa, you know that um, elections have been a cause of tension, cause of violence, cause of war in a number of places. So whenever there is going to be election, we are very, very, antennas are up. And we want to make sure that, you know, we go through the process uh, peacefully without plunging the nation into violence. I have lived for some time now in this country. I saw what went on mm -hmm. during Kwame Nkrumah's time. Even though I was a kid at that time, I could still remember because, I mean, I had an uncle who was an activist, mm -hmm. a CPP activist. Uh, my, my father's hometown was dominated by, you know, the UP, United Party people, okay. and we knew the kinds of things that went on. Kumasi was a hotbed, and, and some parts in, in Ghana. And then, you know, the, the, the PP coming into power, you know, the second, what you call the second republic, uh, where you had the PP, the NAL, National Alliance of Liberals and all that. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was tensive, you know, because, I mean, everybody is trying to win. And then we moved on from there, you know, with military people coming in intermittently. The Third Republic, which souls like us were not in Ghana, so I can't talk too much mm -hmm. about the Third Republic because I was outside. But at least the Fourth Republic, we were here, mm -hmm. and we all saw what, what went on. And in this f Fourth Republic, we have had, you know, um, change of government and all that. And any time there is going to be election, the first election was boycotted. Parliamentary election um, and was, was boycotted. Interesting. By the, by, the, by the MPP. That's when they wrote the stolen verdict. Okay? And so the first parliament, there was no MPP representative there mm -hmm. under the Fourth Republic. It was later on that they came into the game. So we have had this ding-dong thing. And in a country where the two major parties seem to have equal strength, because honestly, the, 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 when you look at the votes, the margins are too small. So everybody thinks that they should be able to gain something. 
Then you look at the number of spoiled votes in the in, in the country, which it could spoiled votes could make a whole lot of difference in this country. So anytime right. there is an election, mm -hmm. the stakes are high. 2016, the stakes are even higher. For the simple reason that 2012, we had this prolonged court situation, which a lot of people were scared. What was going to happen? And, you know, we managed to go sail through. 2016, the fear is that would people be prepared to go to court and seek redress when already people have expressed misgivings about the verdict? So the stakes are very, very, very high. And this is what is creating the situation. And especially when it was said that elections are won at the polling stations, mm -hmm. the voters' register becomes very, very important here. And that's why even this, what do you call it, this minimal thing that we are doing, yeah, limited, limited registration. registration, is becoming an issue. Because people have interpreted vigilance in terms of taking the laws into our own hands to ensure that people we consider to be minors or to be aliens don't come in. Even though the process is there, that if you think that somebody is a minor, this is the process you go through. If you think that this person is an alien, this is the process you go through. People, there is a lot of mistrust in respect of the system that people want to take their laws into their but, own hands. Well, what do you say of the, the, the violence that has been attributed to the registration, limited registration exercise ongoing at the moment? That's, well, that's, tensions in that's precisely the what I'm trying mm -hmm. to explain. Everybody is trying to make sure that they get the right people into the register, mm -hmm. whilst they also want to make sure that perceived opposition people don't get in there. Mm -hmm. And so people are over-suspicious. You look at somebody and you say that this person is a minor. If the person is a minor, you, there are forms that you need to fill. They have put in place arbitration committees that can address the issue to find out what needs to be done. But people have no confidence in that system. So they want to take the laws into their hands. Part of the problem, too, is that in our country, in fact, people have not been tried because of infringing electoral laws. Mm -hmm. We have had people who have done worse things. We don't seem to have evidence of people who have really been tried. Because as soon as you do something wrong and you are picked, it is politicized. Politicians get up. If the person happens to be for party, Black Party, then members of Black Party will have to get up and say that they are doing this against us. Over-politicization of everything. How is it detrimental to our tenet of democracy? It is detrimental to, our tenet, uh, to, 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 to democracy mm -hmm. in our country. It is detrimental in the sense that, you know, we cannot continue. It, it's something that could easily given to violence. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about conflict. Conflicts you cannot avoid. So long as we have different positions, so long as we have different interests, there is bound to be, after all, what is conflict? It's clash of interest. Mm -hmm. But if we are not able to manage conflict, then it goes into violence. And the way people are going, it is as if we are not able to manage conflict. Instead of the thumb, we are using the fist. Okay? And this will not augur well for Ghana. I keep on saying that at the end of the day, what is it that we are looking for power for? You seek power for the good of the country. If the country is in turmoil, if the country is on fire, how do you develop the nation? How do you rule a nation? And it seems to me that laws don't matter anymore. And yet the rule of law is very, very crucial for our democracy. 
Looking at our morality in this country, it appears that the moral attribute of respect um, of the elderly when it comes to public discourse is kind of something that has been sidelined mm. in public conversation. Should we go back to what we usually do in terms of respect to the elderly? The question is whether we can go back. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the whole thing started way, way back during the revolution time. We don't go sit down and make them cheat with where messengers would drive away, you know, um, managing directors from office mm -hmm. and take over. We did that. And we thought, you know, it's, 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 that will solve the problem. But that, when you go back to that period, up until now, we have not been able, we threw away values. The respect for the elderly is no longer there. Now you hear people insulting elderly people, and it doesn't really bother them doing that, that, that kind of thing. And in fact, the one who is able to do it the loudest becomes the hero, which is unfortunate. You can't build a nation like that. Now look at our nation. We, we do not have the culture of silence, but I tell you we have the culture of silence. Because you see, the elderly people are not talking. Mm -hmm. There are certain people who should get up and speak. Are they speaking? They are not speaking because they are scared. They will tag me. They will insult me. I have met, you know, elderly people, people with respect, and I've said, how come that you are quiet? You are not saying anything. I say, sorry, I, I, I'm not interested in these kinds of things. You know, why should it be like that? Asserting your right doesn't mean ignore the responsibilities that go with the right. Rights and responsibilities are together. Unfortunately, we talk about rights, we don't talk about responsibilities. Now, one thing about propaganda that has been ongoing, and uh, recently there's been a letter circulating that the Peace Council um, issued a public uh, notice about an information going around that um, you, you are supporting the particular stance when it comes to violence in this country. Could you please set the record straight for us? You got to tell me what it is because I mean I'm hearing it for the first time mm -hmm. that we support. In it. reference, in reference to what um, Dr. Baumia had to say about um, the presidency being divided in terms of Christian Muslim representation. Represent what happened was, you know, um, Dr. Baumia. My attention was drawn to the fact that Dr. Baumia in the Sisala East area trying to address certain people had made a certain comment. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was TV3, um, um, the Komla Kluge, who called me. And I said, I haven't heard of that. But he sent me the, uh, snap, the, you know, the recorded mm -hmm. thing. I listened to it. And they said that they wanted to interview me. Unfortunately, that day I was so tired because, I mean, I had gone to preach at the funeral service. And apart from the funeral service, I was also at the funeral in Kumasi. <laughs> um, and had done service, you know, um, this was a, was it a Sunday evening. I had administered the Lord's Supper to hundreds of people. Oh. So when I came home, I was really tired. 10 o'clock, I had slept. So when they were calling me, the phone was ringing. When I got up, it was about 10.30. And so I sent a text message to Komla and said, are we still on? I didn't even know what I was. I said, are we still on? And then he said, oh, the thing is over. So Komla had said to me that the next day, they would interview me. I was sleeping early in the morning when an FM station called me and said, we have read something that Peace Council has issued a statement condemning Dr. Baumia. I said, I haven't even commented on this. And as far as I'm concerned, as the current chairman of the National Peace Council, we haven't even met to discuss Dr. Baumia's statement. So who might have sent that? And they say, your name is there. And so I have to tell them, no, 
I have not issued anything. I've not even commented on that. It was later on when they asked me this and I said I had not commented on. Then they said to me, but have you heard? And I said, yes, I have listened to that. And they said, what do you, what do you make of it? And then I told them my peace of mind that as far as I'm concerned, it's, um, I use the expression, I'm not happy with it. It is unfortunate that a man of Dr. Baumia's caliber, I respect Dr. Baumia, for him to have made a statement of that nature because that statement has the potential to play into the hands of um, um, radicals who could make all sorts of things with it. People can get up and say, because this government doesn't have Christians, we will react, or because this government doesn't have um, Muslims, mm -hmm. we will re react. So I was saying that we don't play into the hands of such people. And I went on to make a statement about the dangers of politicking on the basis of religious affiliation and ethnic affiliation. You know that earlier on, Jifa Atigo exactly. had also made a statement, mm -hmm. and I, I had also stated that that was, that was bad. So that's, that's the story. What havoc does these kinds of um, conversations, that is, ethnocentric uh, conversations and comments, have on, on our tenor to democracy? How is it dangerous to our peace and security? Now, look at one of these African countries, mm -hmm. um, what do you call um, where because of ethnic sentiments, the Tutsis and the Hutus, one tribe got massacred. Mm -hmm. You know, tribal politics or ethnic centered politics mm -hmm. can plunge this country into, you know, war, civil war. If it gets into the hands of extremists. And therefore, we should try as much as possible not to do politics based on that. In any case, in our country, politics, when you talk about politics, people have been elected to power because, I mean, they have gained, you know, votes from different ethnic groups and different religious groups. I'm sure the current government, Christians and Muslims and, and, and Ashantis and non-Ashantis and other people, might have voted for them. In the same way, NPP gains its votes from Christians, Muslims, Ashantis, and other ethnic groups of people. Okay? The same way, all other parties have their supporters from the different religious groupings and ethnic groups. So if we are going to do politics, and I get up and say, now look at me. I'm a Christian. I'm a Methodist. So all Methodists should vote for Emmanuel Asante. I think I'll be doing a lot of harm. In my church, the Methodist Church, I have politicians mm -hmm. belonging to the different groupings. People from NDC, people from NPP, people from PPP, people from um, CPP, uh, PNC. I'm sure that even the newer party, Ayaragas party, mm -hmm. will have people in my church who probably will sympathize with them. So what is the point in trying to divide us on the basis of religious and ethnic affi affiliation? It has mm -hmm. the potential mm -hmm. to plunge us into conflict. OK. As the chairman of the National Peace Council going into 2016 election, mm. at the November election, what is your comment or what are you advocating for continuously that should be the hallmark of a solid democracy and a peaceful Ghana? I believe that, one, we should live and let others live. What do I mean by that? You believe that party A mm -hmm. is your party and you must have your reasons for believing in that particular party and for supporting that particular party. It's your right. Now allow me my right mm -hmm. also to support a different political party. Now let us, in terms of ideas, politics should be a contest of ideas. 
Party A believes that this is the way to go about it. That in the national economy, when we do this, it will do. Party B believes this. Let the people decide for themselves. Unfortunately, in this country, you know, there was a lecture at Gempa recently. Mm -hmm. and, and the title of the lecture is Voting for What? At the end of the, the elections, you ask the people, what did you vote for? There are a lot of people who are following parties and doing all sorts of things. What is, does that party stand for? What is the party's manifesto? Do they even know? Even the advocates, people who stand on the platforms, do they even know what their party stands for? I pray that our political culture will grow to the extent that we will begin to do the policies of issues. That is what I call the policies of civility, mm -hmm. not insults, not propaganda that exploits the ignorance of people, but that we will educate people. This economy, this is the way we will go about it. We believe when we take A, B, C, we should be in a position to do that. Somebody was saying that, but the majority of Ghanaians are not educated. So how do you do policies of uh, um, issues that you are talking about? I think if you want to rule this nation, then you love the nation. And it's your responsibility to educate us. Rather, don't exploit our ignorance for your political interest. That is wrong. Wow. Wow. This is a wow, very, very powerful message being delivered by our personality for the week. Most Reverend Emmanuel Asante, we are privileged to have him as our personality. Professor, it's a pleasure having you this Thank afternoon. You. Thank it's you very pleasure. much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So that will be it for the personality profile for the week.